Welcome to Nathaniel Hawthorne's Young Goodman Brown. We are now returning to a more straightforward form of literature after Emerson, a short story by Nathaniel Hawthorne. In this video, we'll take a brief look at the life and times of Nathaniel Hawthorne. We'll look at faith and despair in the story and talk a little bit about the Gothic and how Hawthorne achieves the romantic vision. First, a little bit of background on Hawthorne himself. He was born in 1804, died in 1864. So you can think about uh, the fact that he's, he's living in the 1800s, but most of what you're reading by him, well, most of what one would read by him was written in before the Civil War. Hawthorne lived in Concord, Massachusetts. This image is a picture of his house, The Wayside. He lived in the neighborhood of Ralph Waldo Emerson, you just read, uh, Henry David Thoreau, who wrote Walden, and then Bronson and Louisa May Alcott were transcendentalists. Louisa May Alcott, many of you may be familiar with as the author of Little Women. As you know from reading the story Young Goodman Brown, Puritanism is a theme in Hawthorne's work. He also writes about the Puritans in, uh, in say, the Scarlet Letter. Hawthorne's ancestors were Puritans. His great great grandfather was John Hawthorne, um, and he was his great great grandfather John was involved in the Salem witch trials. Hawthorne, Nathaniel Hawthorne, regretted this association and to distance himself from John Hawthorne and that Puritan background, he added a W to his name. So you'll note that. Um, Nathaniel Hawthorne is spelled H-A-W instead of H-A-T-H. Uh, so he did that to distance himself, and you'll notice that there is a struggle in the story um, with that kind of Puritan vision of being judgmental and the like. In fact, Hawthorne is writing during an era of challenges to re religious tradition. Emerson, as you know, resigned from being a preacher so that he could pursue transcendentalism. Uh, the Alcotts, Bronson Alcott, Louisa May Alcott, were also transcendentalists. Uh, they were all challenging the practice of organized religion and kind of seeking um, to better themselves, to improve their souls on their own. It's not that Hawthorne was a transcendentalist himself, but, we, but he was part of a community that largely was. They all lived in the same neighborhood and interacted with each other. As you read, you are going to want to think about Hawthorne's point of view about Puritans, Christianity, sin, grace, judgment, uh, that, that sort of topic. Perhaps rather than being a transcendentalist or a Puritan, Hawthorne may be giving us a moderating vision between judgment, guilt, and grace. So you might think about what he's hinting at as a way to live. Many of Hawthorne's stories put Puritans in a critical light, not Christianity per se, but he calls all of his readers to question their tendencies to see evil everywhere. He points up the work of grace in the presence of guilt. So we don't want to forget to look for how he does this. How does he show us maybe something more hopeful? Think about the character Faith. Do you like her? What's good or bad about her? And then how does Hawthorne make you feel the way you do about her? Whenever you're reading fiction and you have a reaction to a character where you like one character better than another, look at the descriptions of the characters. Look at the interactions between the characters. How do the descriptions sound? What within the line makes you like the character or not like the character? Would Hawthorne praise Faith? Or would he praise young Goodman Brown? How do you know that? Despair. How does young Goodman Brown's life end? Think about young Goodman Brown as opposed to faith. What is the concluding point in the story? How do you, how do you feel about his character? Do you agree with him? Do you want to have a talk with him and set him straight? How does Hawthorne make you feel the way you do? Does, he, does Hawthorne agree with or celebrate Faith or Young Goodman Brown? And then how do you know? How does he make you respond the way you do?
Now let's look at a few technical points. Hawthorne style. When you read, you should always look for symbols when it's Hawthorne. Um, there, uh, we're going to look for symbols and we're going to look at how he creates the romance. First, symbolism. You want to think about, okay, Faith's name, of course, is symbolic. But also, what color are her ribbons? Whenever you start off a story with something like, she has pink ribbons. Why pink? They're not red. Red would indicate sin, like the scarlet A in the scarlet letter. They're also not white. They're not pure and innocent. Pink is, we associate pink with babies. Um, but think about mm, really innocence would be represented symbolically with white. Pink is in between the red and the white. What does that say about Faith's soul? But then also do we react positively or negatively to the fact that she has pink ribbons? What would it mean if she had white ribbons? What kind of character would she be? Also think about the old man, the devil's staff. It looks like a snake. Um, why does it look like a snake? What's the association? Where do they go? Where does the old man go with um, young Goodman Brown? They go off into the woods. What do the woods symbolize? A wild place where mysterious things happen. The old man, whom does he resemble? Whom did he know in the past? Um, and then also if we look at the first two or three pages of the story, you find a passage where Goodman Brown shows up and the old man says, you, you are late, Goodman Brown. The clock of the Old South was striking as I came through Boston, and that's a full 15 minutes ago. You want to think about um, some of the miraculous things in the story, not just the symbolism, but moving ahead, the romance. You want to think about the fact that, well, you don't, you may not know this if you aren't from the um, Boston area, but the clock of the Old South is so far from where the devil meets young Goodman Brown that he couldn't have come there in 15 minutes unless it was miraculously, it was miraculously fast he got there. Also, think about that in the next two paragraphs or two paragraphs later, the description of that staff, which bore the likeness of a great black snake so curiously wrought, it might almost be seen to twist and wriggle itself like a living serpent. This, of course, must have been an ocular deception assisted by the uncertain light. Now, this is one of those points where you want to be thinking about how is it that Hawthorne does what he does. He doesn't say that the staff wriggled and was miraculous, and so it must be the devil um, himself. Instead, he says, no, 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 that's just an ocular deception, a trick of the eye. So he very much like... Charles Brockton Brown gave us that logical explanation. Hawthorne also gives us that logical explanation. Oh, it's just the light. It's a trick of the eye, something like that. So Hawthorne's definition of romance, as you see here, it should mingle the marvelous rather as a slight, delicate, and evanescent flavor rather than as the actual substance of the dish offered to the public. You need to think about the fact that he tries to make it seem like, oh, this is a logical explanation for everything. But really, there are little spices, little flavors of the miracle, of the miraculous, of the marvelous, just little hints of those flavors of something unusual and mysterious, the same way that Charles Brockton Brown did in Whelan. So we, we see him nod to logic but he maintains the miraculous uh, and something that is not completely natural. Think about how he does what he does as you read. Think about, as we've already talked about here, uh, how he's responding to the Puritans, but he isn't rejecting all of the Christian vision. What parts do you think he's keeping? What are his suggestions for how to live?